I was sitting there tonight listening to the choir singing, and I remembered many years ago when I came and spoke to the Lundell Community Church. The size of the church was about the size of the choir. And we walked into a building across the street. And we dared to talk about some impossible dreams. We dared to talk about what Lyondale could become. And we dared to talk about the visibility of God at work here in this community. As I sat there tonight and I listened to the choir sing and I looked around me and I saw all the people here, I looked at the structure and I saw all the things that were going on, I thought about the fact that a miracle has taking place right in our midst. Amen. Sometimes we have to open our eyes to see it and to know that God is at work. I like to read a, I have to use glasses in my old age. I like to read the words of a song. And this song is for those of us who somehow or another are part of the black culture. It says, the song says, I'll fly away. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. To a home on God's celestial shores, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. When, when this life is over, hallelujah, bye and bye, I'll fly away. And then there's another song that's somewhat in the white culture. It says, when we all get to heaven, sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will jump and shout for victory. And then there's another song that might fit all of us. It says, just over in glory land, I have a home prepared for the saints of God, just over in glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side, just over in glory land. Just over in glory land, I'll join the happy angel band, just over in glory land. And I read those songs because I think these songs are, are wonderful, beautiful. Nice, flowing words. And sometimes we in our, our situations tend to think about one day when God takes us to be with him in heaven. And some of us are so busy thinking about the point of heaven that we forget about the point of earth that God has called us to occupy. We forget about the point of earth that God has called for us to control. We forget about the point of earth that God has called for us to take hold of it. We forget about our part in the plan of God to reach out all around the world, starting first of all in our own Jerusalem, and then moving to Judea and Samaria, and then somehow another daring to reach out to the remotest parts of the world. And what I want to talk about briefly tonight, because somebody told me don't speak as long as John Perkins, and I think he was a standard, so they said don't speak as long as he's going. <laughs> but, but to somehow or another keep you within the framework of, of the time so that the other brothers will have a chance. <laughs> they tried to put me on first so they could pull my you know, coat and tell me to stop and all that kind of stuff. But what I want to talk about is I want to talk about our vision, vision and God's call on my life. And what I want to deal with is I want to deal with God's call on my own life and to sort of tie that into God's call as we think about Christian community development. Because truly, my life went through a number of different calls. And the question is, do we hear the voice when God calls us? And when he calls us through different stages of our lives, and he calls us for a specific purpose to be available to move out and do what he wants us to do. The first call on Dolphus Weary Life was a call to religion. There are folk here that probably can identify with that because somehow or another in some church somewhere, you somehow or another join a church movement. Whether you're talking about the Catholic church or whether you're talking about a Baptist church or whatever church, you were called in some form to be a member of a church. 
Dolphus Weary was called to be a member of a church. And as a member of a church, I became a very active person within that church because I thought that being a member of the church was the thing that you're supposed to do. I saw everybody else going to church, and plus if you look at statistics, within the black community almost anywhere in this country, you will find out that folk are church members. Whether they understand salvation and whether they understand what it means to walk with the Lord or not, they're still members of somebody's church. God called me to be a member of a church. But he didn't leave me there, and I'm so happy that he didn't. I'm so happy that God didn't leave me just as a pew-sitting person, lost on my way to hell, not knowing anything about the wonderful grace of God, how God can take my life and do something with it fantastic, a whole lot greater than I can do with my life no matter how hard I try. He did not leave me in the corner of religion, but God somehow did to call me to salvation. And in rural Mississippi, in Mendenhall, Mississippi, under the ministry of John Perkins way back when, in 1964, there was a tent meeting, and at that tent meeting, the person was speaking from Psalms 116, 12, that says, What shall I run to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? And that night I heard a specific call to give my life to Jesus Christ. And I didn't quite understand all of the dynamics of that, but I understood one thing, that God had called me to be a part of his marvelous family. And he had somehow or another opened up the door of heaven so that I would have access, you know, to the throne of grace and to the, the family of God. And then through Bible studies and so forth, I began to walk in that. And then there was a third call in my life, and that call was a call for preparation. Somebody said, why is that important? It was so important to me because I grew up in rural Mississippi. It was so important to me because I understood within the black culture there were not that many people who had had preparation in terms of being able to take the Word of God and write and divide the Word of God and somehow or another be able to expound the Word of God. I saw in my community that there were 35 black churches in Simpson County. None of those black churches had a full-time preaching ministry on a Sunday morning. None of those black churches had pastors who had gone to seminary. None of those black churches that had pastors who had graduated from high school. None of those black churches had pastors who understood what it meant to be a pastor of a church. And I used to judge that. I used to look at that and say that because those individuals were not prepared, that somehow or another our people were groping around in darkness, not understanding the truth. And God somehow or another called me to a place of preparation. And one day through the work of John Perkins and John MacArthur in California and a number of other people, God worked it out for me to somehow or another go to school in California. And oh, let me tell you something, believers, it used to thrill my heart as I used to go to white churches and I saw white people coming into the church carrying the Bibles in their hand, opening up their Bibles to talk about studying the Word of God. But it also was a great burden to me because I could not recognize a black church where black folk were carrying the Bible in there and opening that Bible up and somehow or another looking into the Word of God and what God had to say to them about their life. I saw us caught up in emotionalism and religion, but I did not see us caught up in following the Word of God. And I wanted to somehow or another, go to that school and get prepared to somehow or another move to do what God wanted me to do. I remember that, that, that the president of the institution was just waiting on me to make a mistake to ship me back to Mississippi because, you see, he didn't want me there. But you see, the reason I went there because there was something there that I knew that my community so desperately needed. I could care less about what he thought about me. I could care less about what the people thought of me. I understood that there was something there that I needed. And if I understood that there was something there I needed, I somehow or another went to L.A. Baptist College and to L.A. Baptist Theological Seminary. But God didn't leave me there. God also called me to ministry. Because I understood the great commission that says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every single person. And then I understood the verse of scripture that says, we need to somehow or another take that commission serious. And I began to take it serious. But I'm so glad that God didn't leave me there. Because God began to call me back to Mississippi. Against the grain, and all of my life saying to God, I want to get out of Mississippi. I want to get out of poverty and racism and injustice. I want to get out of hope, hopelessness. I want to get out of situations that are terrible and, and somehow or another I wanted to move far away, but somehow or another that as we worked and as we began to think about some things, that we had the opportunity in 1969 
1968 to begin to work with the ministry in Mendenhall, Mississippi. And then in 1969 to work with the ministry and then we had the opportunity to travel with a Christian basketball team that took me to the Orient and we were playing ball in Taiwan when the coach challenged me about overseas missions. And as much as I thought about overseas missions, I understood that I was not being called to overseas mission. I was being running, I was really running away from God's call on my life to go back to Mississippi to believe him to use me. And as I began to understand that, the question kept coming to my mind. Douglas, what in the world are you doing? 10,000 miles away from home. And there are people in Mississippi that are still trapped in racism. They're still trapped in poverty. They're still trapped in injustice. They're still trapped in ignorance. They're still trapped in religion. And God began to lay it on my heart to go back to Mississippi to be a part of a movement. To know something growing up black and growing up poor. Growing up in a situation where black people had three choices. One of the choices was to walk around and act happy, even though you were not happy. The second choice was to rebel, and for those people who rebelled, they were beat, they were lynched, they were run out of town. The third choice was to leave. And I remember that in 1965, when I graduated from high school, within two weeks after graduation, 75% of my classmates left Mississippi, coming to Chicago and Detroit, and going other places, looking for a greater place to live. But somehow or another, God called me to stay there and to be a part of a movement. But I'm so glad that God didn't leave me there. Because God called me not only to go back to Mendenhall, Mississippi, but God called me to be involved in Christian community development. You see, somehow or another, we understood early on that poor people, somehow or another, came to know the Lord as their Savior, that poor people still, who love the Lord Jesus Christ, still live in shacks, still live without adequate health care, still lived across the track in some dilapidated houses, still did not have rights and privileges within society, but yet they loved Jesus Christ. And somehow or another there was a paradox in our society that said that people who are poor who love Jesus and people who are fluent in our society who love Jesus, that one day we all are going to get to heaven and we're going to enjoy the beauties of heaven. That's a paradox. It's a paradox in our society that must be dealt with. It's a paradox that somehow or another that says People who are trapped 
people who want a sense of out. I thought someone must begin to talk about developing a ripple of hope. And let me talk about the ripple of hope. You see, when I went back to Manitou, Mississippi in 1971, after graduating from college and seminary, there was John Perkins and his family, and a guy by the name of Herbert Jones, Dolphus Weary and his family. Follow me now. Those were the only individuals in rural Mississippi struggling with the reality of what are we going to do about the problem? Because you see, the problem is too enormous for any of us to talk about handling by ourselves, but somebody has to dare to say we have to start a ripple of hope. And the fantastic and marvelous thing that God has been doing since those three folk got together in Mrs. Mendenhall, Mississippi in 1971, there have been ripples of hope that started across this country. So that in Mendenhall, Mississippi right now, there are 48 full-time staff people at work in Mendenhall, Mississippi. There's a health clinic and there's a school and there's a community law office, there's a radio ministry, there's a thrift store, there's a farm, there's an adult education ministry, there's a pastor's development ministry. And oh, when I look back at those pastors that we so criticized years ago, God has given us a marvelous opportunity to begin to work with these pastors, to begin to show them that they can be involved in ministry the way God would have them to be involved in ministry. And to see these men who've never done evangelism before begin to do evangelism, to see these men who've never led a crusade before begin to lead crusades, I say that's a ripple of hope. But you know, he didn't stop there as God continues to work in Voice of Calvary Ministries in Jackson, in New Hebron Ministries in Pasadena, California. And guess what? All of you. Isn't that something? That in some form and in some fashion, you have been taught with a ripple of hope in your life. And I remember serving on the board of Voice of Hope in Dallas and seeing Catholics struggle with the reality of developing a ripple of hope. And for those who are here tonight, there's a wonderful manual of success that's back there on that shelf that you need to take home so that you can begin to study some practical realities of how God can use in your life to do the ministry that he's called you to do. Because one of the crying questions around the country is, how do we do it? Where do we start? And God has used Captain Voice of Hope to put together a manual that you can use somehow or another enable God to take your ministry the next step. But believers, as I close, there's something I need to say. There must be a calling in all of us to go. Let me say it again. There must be a calling in all of us to go. We live in a society of upward mobility and outward mobility. And if anybody will dare to look back it has to be a call. But believers, let me tell you this. It must be a call for anybody to stay. There are so many fly-by-night folks who want to somehow or another say, I want to do it. And there are so many fly-by-night folks who want to say, give me a three-year plan to do it. There are so many fly-by-night folks who are looking for instantaneous solutions to the problem. And I'm here to tell you that the problem got the way it is over a long period of time. And I guarantee you, if any kind of success is going to come, it's going to take all of you. We all have to be in it because we're guilty. Because guilt will fade away. We all have to be in it because we feel like we owe somebody something. Because that will fade away. We all to be in it because we feel called. Because if we do it because we feel called, when things get rough, you won't quit. When things get tough, you won't quit. When things don't go your way, you won't quit. And I marvel at the fact that the that voice of Calvary and John Perkins has used the concept of the three R's that says we have to talk about relocation, we have to talk about redistribution, and we have to talk about reconciliation. I'm here to tell you that we also have to talk about resilience. The ability to keep bouncing back. Now, let me tell you something. As I've been there for 21 years, if you don't have the ability to keep bouncing back, then this whole concept of Christian community development is going to fly up in your face, and you're going to quit, and you're going to leave it. I'm so glad. I am so glad that God, when he calls us, nothing else matters. Because you have to identify with the good of it as well as the bad of it. And some of us want to somehow or another garner from these meetings 
that we have to keep on bouncing back, even when we don't feel like it. And we have to keep on bouncing back, no matter how difficult the day is, because we've been called. And because we've been called, because we've been called, we can do, do no less than listen to the 